Uh, hi, folks. Sorry. Yep. Uh, hi, folks. Good to see you and uh, commend the good work of HBH. And uh, good to see my friend Clive uh, Butler there too in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, isn't this a unique way of communicating? Uh, you know, everybody's technical skills have had to sort of, you know, advance very quickly in this last sort of 12 months. So um, I live not too far away. I'm in my home office here in Highland Park. And uh, we're fortunate we live on the hill. I was just saying to one or two before, I, above the, the line of my camera, I can look outside. So despite being constrained to my home office for usual church duties and my community work, it is good to have sunny days and warmer weather. And that's what we're enjoying at the moment. Um, just by way of acknowledging Lee's sort of introduction there about aviation history, most of you know that I've been involved in full-time Christian ministry here in East Auckland now for 27 years. Uh, first at Trinity Methodist Church and then at East City Wesleyan. So very involved in this changing landscape of East Auckland. And uh, just as a pointer to 2022 will be the 175th year of Howick and Districts, 1847, when the fencible soldiers and families arrived at Howick Beach. Uh, to sort of commence the howick that we, you know, know and cherish today. So I said to Lee, I'd be happy to talk about howick 175 matters because I'm very involved in the committee too. But today I want to share about uh, um, the history of and development of airlines in New Zealand. And some people immediately say, well, Richard, you know, you're a church minister. What are you talking about aviation matters? And uh, I tell them about my, my late father, who's been gone for a long time now, but he was um, an Englishman, came from Shropshire, and uh, became a boy apprentice uh, in the late 1930s with the RAF, so was well po uh, positioned to serve during World War II, first as an engineer and then as a pilot. And he was put into a, towards the end of the year, put into a New Zealand squadron, 75 squadron and on the Lancasters flying over Nazi Germany doing their thing, half the crew were Kiwis, half of them were, were Pommies. And so there was quite a banter as you can appreciate. And I think out of those beginnings, my father's links to New Zealand at 30,000 feet being shot at, the idea and the prospect of uh, sunny flying conditions and safe, safe uh, environment in New Zealand was very appealing. And my parents, after World War II, came to came to New Zealand. Um, so hence, I, I'm a, I'm a Kiwi. Now, um, perhaps a question I can ask, and if it was a live group, I'd ask you to turn to the person next to you. But we have a number of peers, so you can do that. If I was to ask you, when was your first flight? What aircraft was it? What year was it? And where did you go? Just pause for half a minute and think about your first flight. Talk about it to the person next to you if you're with somebody else, and then maybe we can unmute and have a little brief discussion on that before I get underway with my PowerPoint slides. My first, my first flight was an old bone shaker. Uh, held together with rivets. I can't remember what it was, but it was only a short 40 minutes flight down across uh, the UK. I was working in Heathrow Airport at the time, and we went there every Monday and back on a Friday. Oh boy, those were bone shit. So what year was that, uh, Brian? Uh, about 1965, somewhere about there. 65, okay. Anybody go back further than 1965? Yep. Yeah, 19, 1951, DC-3 from Kaitaia to Auckland. Oh, very good, 1951. Well, that's a wee while ago, Chris. Uh, I can manage 1963. Oh. I'm not sure what it was, probably a DC-3, actually, from Christchurch to Whanaupai. Mm -hmm. uh, that was before the current airport was opened. That's right, Whanaupai was the main airport here, yes. Yep. 1957 for me, a little wee um, plane hopped over to Blenheim from oh, Wellington. From Wellington. Oh, yes, that's right. 57, probably a heron. Mm. Uh -huh. 
Well, you know, things have changed and I want to, in my PowerPoint display, sort of describe from the beginnings of how, you know, aviation made such an impact on New Zealand that, in fact, aviation was tailor-made for the geography and the mountainous terrain of New Zealand. So, Lee, if you've got my slides there, you can put, put, put up and we'll just, I'll speak briefly to each one and we'll, we'll go from there. So, folks, if you want to sort of chip in and ask a question, if you can, you're welcome, as long as we just keep the momentum going. Can you hear me? Yes. That's Barbara. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hi, Barbara. Hello. <laughs> I was going to add my flight, but I couldn't find the button. <laughs> oh. Do you got? So when was your flight, Barbara? It was about um, 1949, 50. And I, I went from... Um, uh, Jersey, uh, we'd actually gone from England to Jersey on a boat and it was so bad, my mother said we would fly back <laughs> and it was a little plane with about six or eight seats and they weighed us, which was yeah. terribly embarrassing <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> That's right. It was probably a de Havilland repeat and I probably got a photograph of it here, here Barbara, so they were flown here in New Zealand. Um, thank you for sharing. Well, look, you may, you may go back a little earlier than anyone else then, back to 49. There was no one else yeah. with a flight before 1949? Okay. Right, Lee, uh, next slide, please. Here's, um, uh, can everyone see that, I presume? This is a, um, um, a, co a copy of a photograph of a very famous aircraft coming into land at Tyree in Dunedin in 1934. And does anyone recognize what the plane is? <laughs> Isn't it one the Southern Cross or something like that? That's exactly right. It's a, it's a Charles Kingsford Smith and the Southern Cross. In fact, you can't quite see it that clearly, but it's Southern Cross is on the side of the fuselage. This was the first aircraft to come from overseas to land in New Zealand. So it made the first trip across the Tasman in 1928 and landed at Wigram in Christchurch. And where it touched down on the Wigram aerodrome, there was a plaque, uh, a big concrete plaque put. This was the, the place where the first tyre hit the grass that actually came from somewhere else outside of New Zealand. So very important. And then the Southern Cross made tours throughout New Zealand over a number of years. So here it is at Tyree. And uh, Royal Ice Cream probably predates us all, really. But <laughs> So as it toured around the country, it made a huge impact. And Kingsford Smith took people for one pound joyride flights. So for the first time, an ordinary Kiwi could go up in a plane to see our amazing landscape. So revolutionary. Thank you, Lee. Also 1928, this is a gypsy moth. This was the first small de Havilland trainer. This is before the tiger moth. And a, a, a reliable engine, a reliable airframe. And this was the aircraft that many of the pioneer pilots in New Zealand learned to fly on uh, with the early aero clubs. So the aero clubs were started by air-minded people around New Zealand from 1928. First club, I think, was Marlborough. So mostly young men, but interestingly enough, a number of younger women too. So maybe, you know, five or 10% of women in the late 1920s, early 1930s were very adventurous in learning to fly aircraft uh, like this. Thank you. This is a de Havilland 50. This was the first aircraft that flew a part of the main trunk. So the main trunk, it's almost it's a railway term, I, I guess, but the main trunk, you know, Air Service, Auckland, uh, Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin. And this aircraft flew the Christchurch Dunedin service in 1930, and it could take about three passengers. But the service only lasted for four months, it wasn't really economic. And the, the problem they had was they couldn't convince the public that it was safe to fly and uh, it was also more expensive than going on a bus or on the rails. 
So in the very early days, aviation couldn't compete, but that was soon to change. Thank you. Now this is a this is a painting of a very famous Leo White photograph. Uh, Leo White was a well-known photographer here in Auckland from the 1930s till the 1970s, and it, this this is an the, the black and white photograph looks just like that, but of course this is a colour painting. Now I wonder if anyone can tell me where that is. Any guesses? No, okay. This is the first airline service in New Zealand. It wasn't in Auckland or Wellington, Christchurch or Dunedin. It was from Hokitika on the west coast of the South Island. And the service was from Hokitika to Franz Joseph to Haast. And along the way, the aircraft dropped into beaches. And this is at Bruce Bay in South Westland in September 1935. And right in the middle there, you'll see the tall pilot. He's just uh, coming to talk to the children. That's Captain Bert Mercer, the first pilot of the first scheduled air service in New Zealand. And behind him is a de Havilland Fox Moth with a single engine, a little cabin for two or three people. And this photograph here, September 1935. In my research, and I wrote a couple of books on, the, um, on this particular service, and I talked to the, the little girl who's on the back of the horse with her dad. I met her when she was about 80 years of age. And uh, she said to me, her dad was there, he was a local farmer. And every time the plane dropped in, Captain Mercer used to bring hot bread or he had sweets in his pockets. And the kids were all highly excited. And here's a passenger coming out with his bag. So isn't that remarkable? That was, that was scheduled air services in the mid 1930s. Thank you, Lee. Now, this is the second airline in New Zealand. And again, that's a little bit of a familiar, more familiar landscape in the background. And again, any guesses as to where that might be? This is uh, East Coast Airways in the North Island. And uh, the air service is coming from Napier to Gisborne. So that's young Nick's head in the background. So just coming in quite low before he's coming in to land at Gisborne. This is the first twin-engined aircraft in New Zealand on scheduled services. This is a de Havilland Dragon. So like the Fox Moth on the beach, these are a wooden framed fabric aircraft with small engines, so the two engines, and there's about six passengers. So similar to the Jersey Airways sort of service from the 1930s and 1940s. And uh, I did a book on this air service into Gisborne some years ago, and I talked to a lady who was the second, she was on the second flight, this was April 1935. And you see there were, you can actually see the passengers, see in the back there, that's a painting, uh, a very good painting, isn't it? She said, as they're flying from, from Napier to Gisborne, about halfway across, one of the passengers undid his seatbelt and went to stand up and to take a photograph. And all the passengers said, sit down, sit down, you will make the whole plane tip over. So, you know, this was all sort of pioneering stuff, you know, air pockets, turbulence, sit in your seat, otherwise the plane might, you know, tip over. <laughs> so 1935, next slide, Lee. So the third airline, uh, now just actually just a point to the first two airlines, Hokitika and Gisborne. And what's the commonality of those two? Very isolated places. So private enterprise, you know, private investment monies, they could make uh, airlines economic and work, providing services in very isolated areas. It wasn't to the main centres. So here's the third airline in New Zealand. This is Cook Strait Airways. And this is a de Havilland Rapide or a Domini. And uh, now that's, uh, I guess, uh, you can recognise where that is, Wellington. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, this is late 1935. And uh, the repeat, the Domini is coming from Nelson to Wellington, and it also goes back to Blenheim. So it did that sort of triangle route. And Cook Strait Airways had five of these uh, 
de Havilland Rapides, again, very similar aircraft to the two that I've described. There's the Tamahini, the ferry, going out uh, across Cook Strait, heading to, to Nelson. And interestingly, you know, these, they had five of these Rapides, Cook Strait Airways, a private airline from Nelson, and they did 19,821 crossings from 1935 to 1939, and they experienced no engine failures. So this is, you know, primitive technology, 1930s, the weather at that time in Cook Strait was no better than it is today, very windy, you know, blustery conditions, and they established a highly reliable, efficient air service. So a real testimony to Kiwi pilots and, and, and engineers and the administration staff. So the Rapides here, two of these aircraft are still flying in New Zealand today, all restored, and you can still go for a, for a flight in one. Um, how many people on board? Uh, these could take anything from six to eight. I think the normal, normal was six people plus the baggage. Thanks, Lee. Now, the fourth airline was Union Airways, which was related to Union shipping. In fact, the shipping companies in the 1920s and 1930s realized they were, of course, in the business of transport. So they were very interested in airlines and the potential aviation had. So they put money into, into the development of airlines. This was the largest of the airlines, Union Airways, established in 1936. And uh, from Palmerston North, a base in Palmerston North, center sort of of New Zealand. Um, and uh, they decided they really needed a sophisticated aircraft to fly the route from Auckland to Wellington, that the smaller, you know, wooden framed fabric aircraft weren't up for the distances uh, or the terrain. So they very boldly got permission from the government to import American aircraft. So this is a, a Lockheed Electra that was very advanced when it came to New Zealand in 1937. So you can see it's very sleek, very modern looking compared to the aircraft we've looked at. Um, at the twin tail, it was the first all metal aircraft in New Zealand, assembled at Hobsonville and flown in June 1937. In that month, this aircraft, AZKAFD, was the first airliner to serve Auckland. And the service was Auckland, and the, the airfield was the grass airfield at Mungary, where the international airport is today. And it flew Auckland, New Plymouth, Palmerston North, Wellington. And eventually it did a direct service as well. So an advanced aircraft, and uh, they said with a tailwind, it could almost do 200 miles an hour and was faster than anything that the Air Force had at the time. So 10 passengers and two pilots in the front, so 12 people on board. This again is a painting, there's no colour images from the 1930s, but that's a, it's a grand shot, isn't it? Thank you, Lee. Right, so here we are over the Waitamata Harbour, not far away from us, and you can see the ferry to the left. Now the ferry must be going very fast if it's out in front. <laughs> Uh, but here's one of the one of the ferries, and there's the Lockheed Electra, and that's the same aircraft, ZKAFD. And in fact, the fuselage of that very aircraft survives at Motat uh, Museum there in, in, in Western Springs. So if we just go to the next photograph, uh, Lee. Richard, can I ask a question about the, the Lockheed aircraft? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, you said it was assembled in New Zealand. So how did the pieces get here? Oh, they came by, by ship from the United States with American engineers, and they came out, assembled it, and trained the New Zealand pilots. Thank you. Now, this photograph is, is again, the Electra on a demonstration run over Auckland in 1937. 
it's quite low. In fact, it looks to me lower than 500 feet, but it's always hard to get a perspective. But you can see it there in the lower center of the photograph. And uh, it's almost following parallel to Queen Street. So bottom right is the um, Civic Theatre. And uh, you can see in the, uh, the top right is the um, Wedding Cake Tower of the University. So even in 1937, you know, lower Queen Street there was, you know, very built up. Now the Electra is, is flying over Auckland as a demonstration of this new airliner technology that was bringing, you know, airline services to Auckland for the first time, so 1937. So almost even today in living memory of older folks who can remember these days of the, 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 the late 30s wartime and 1940s. So it's, it's almost beyond living memory, but it's a great shot too, isn't it? Thank you, Lee. Now here's the same aircraft um, at uh, Mangere. This is the Union Airways hangar. And this is, um, this is a Sunday in late 1937. So uh, the, the services uh, flew on Sunday, so it's come up from Wellington. And this is a typical Sunday afternoon when people have driven out all the way up to Mangere to see, you know, this new Lockheed airliner servicing uh, Auckland. And um, I think it must be winter time from all the coats and the, and the hats. Maybe it's not that much later in 37, but you can see the number of hats. They must have been conscious of the sun even in those days. There's a couple of school uniform boys, but this was the sort of interest and passion. This is sort of, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, space stuff in the last 30 or 40 years. Well, in the 1930s, this was cutting edge technology. So there's the Electra uh, named, you know, Kawaka, named after native birds, and how modern and sleek and how appealing it was to people uh, to have a look at. And also notice in those days, health and safety wasn't a big deal. Everybody swarms out all around the aircraft. <laughs> you can't do that today, can you? Thank you. So here we have the situation by 1939. And the lines there are all the air scheduled. This is scheduled almost daily services that were being provided uh, around New Zealand. So 1939, of course, the war broke out in September. But we can see that by the, by the end of the 1930s, quite a sophisticated service of air scheduled air services were being operated in New Zealand, um, mostly remarkably safe, safely. So you can see Palmerston North in those days had quite a key role because of its position. You can see the West Coast run. There was even a, a scheduled air service from Inchbonny, which is inland from Hokitika, right down to Dunedin, but nothing is yet to Invercargill. But again, just reiterating what I was saying, aviation was tailor-made for moving people around New Zealand. We have the barrier of Cook Strait. We have a long skinny country that's very mountainous and quite hard to get around. And all of a sudden Kiwis could not only see the, the grandeur and the beauty of this country, but move around quite quickly. So you could fly even in the Lockheed Electra, a direct flight from Auckland to Palmerston North in about one hour and a half instead of you know a good 24 hours road trip so there's some remarkable stories about the time saving for example the dragon from napier to gisborne uh, it was a 50 minute flight uh, the alternative was a nine hour service car ride in a small bus so nine hours windy roads or 50 minutes by the plane revolutionary isn't it Thank you, Lee. So we're now, now I'm, I'm concentrating on civil aviation here, not military. So this is at the end of the war. This is 1945 at uh, Rongatai in Wellington. This is a Lockheed um, Lodestar, which is a bigger sort of fatter version of the, um, the Electra. Still got the polished double um, tail there. And um, 
I guess it must have been a typical windy, windy day in Wellington, but it looks a bit bleak, doesn't it? Everybody's, um, everybody's dressed up. And in fact, airline flying right through until about the 1960s, it was quite a formal event. So for men and women, you know, coats and hats and gloves, there was no jandals and T-shirts like you see people flying today. And we'll see some other photographs coming up, but uh, that's 1945. This is the interior of a DC-3. We had a number of you say you'd had flights. Uh, DC-3s became common from the very late 40s, about 49, 50, and flew in New Zealand until about 19, early 1970s. So were very popular, 26 to 28 seats. Now, this is a photograph uh, about 1949 on a Auckland to Wellington service. No, sorry, Auckland to Christchurch service, a direct service. And it took three and a half hours, Auckland to Christchurch. And they thought that was incredibly fast. <laughs> you can do it now, what, in just over an hour. So three and a half hours. And uh, because it was three and a half hours, they needed to have a cup of tea. Um, so they struck the issue of, well, how do they do that? So there was a big debate in Union Airways and NAC that was taking over at this time. Should they have female hostesses or should they have male stewards? And the debate rested uh, in the end on going for male stewards, a little bit like the sort of the, you know, the railways, the ferries. And there's also a memo, I haven't got it here in front of me, but it's in my archives, where, where they thought that having female hostesses and the crew would be a distraction to everyone. <laughs> So this is, this is why Fred Bennett is giving the cup of tea to the passengers on a flight from Auckland uh, to Wellington. And doesn't he look very dapper? Mm. Oh. This is uh, a horrible photograph, really, but I have it there because it describes something of the cost of the development of airlines in New Zealand. This is a Lockheed Electra that hit the top of Mount Ruapehu in 1948 on a Palmerston North to Hamilton scheduled service, and um, um, 13 people were killed in what was New Zealand's worst aviation disaster. In fact, it took a week for them to find that, that awful wreckage. Um, complexity of issues, terrible weather, cyclone, uh, poor um, uh, uh, navigation issues and beacons and the aircraft was lost. So I just want you to realise that the development of aviation came at a cost because of learnings along the way. And I'll touch on that again in a few minutes. Thank you. Now here's, uh, this is a, a nicer photograph to look at. This is at Franz Joseph near the glacier uh, in the early 1960s. And my my father was chief pilot for West Coast Airways, and this is one of their dominies, or rapides. And as a young boy, I used to uh, be responsible for hopping out of that cabin door and putting out the little metal steps. And in the background, you can see just a little bit in the valley there, that's where, where the glacier is. But what a, what a beautiful day. And I know my dad and the other pilots, they did a lot of tourist flying. Today, you can do it by helicopter, but in those days, you did it by the dominy. And up, up, they used to weave up the glacier and uh, around Mount Cook, if you paid a little more, and back down to Frange. So this was the development in the post-war years of tourist flying. And of course, New Zealand had a lot to show. So uh, the small number of overseas tourists who went on the flights were just so impressed and enamoured by uh, what New Zealand had to offer. And of course, today, you know, our putting the pandemic to one side, our tourism industry is a very big one. This is another airline my father was involved in. This is uh, Trans Island Airways and the spirit of North Otago there on the nose. This was an Omaru financed uh, airline that did Omaru, Timaru, Christchurch, Nelson from 1956-57. And this was a beach craft 18 and again, an American aircraft very sophisticated and it was at the time actually one of the fastest airliners in New Zealand and the actual aircraft survives in a museum in, um, in Alice Springs of all places. Thank you.
Oh. Right, so the DC-3 was getting um, a bit obsolete by the 1950s and into the 60s. So um, all the private airlines in New Zealand were um, in a compulsory way nationalised by the Labour government post-war and became the New Zealand National Airways Corporation or NAC. It was an iconic brand in New Zealand, NAC. And uh, so here's an NAC Vickers Viscount. This is a British advanced aircraft at the opening of the new airport in Dunedin at uh, Mamona um, in 1962. So Mamona is quite a drive out from Dunedin. I'm sure most of you have been there one time or another. So this is the opening and the, the, uh, the Viscounts were introduced in 1958, particularly on the main trunk. So Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin. They could take up to 60 passengers and they had very large windows. So look on the left there, see the oval windows? They were, they were literally sort of, well, half a metre deep, um, sort of 18 inches, 20 inches deep, no more than that, two, two or three feet deep. Um, and the, the cabin was pressurised, so it was quieter, and the aircraft with its turboprop four engines could fly much higher. So all of a sudden much more comfortable, the aircraft's flying higher, far less turbulence, and almost overnight, air sickness was a thing of the past. So in earlier days with the aircraft I've been describing up until about now, flying much lower, you know, three, five, 10,000 feet, our mountainous terrain in New Zealand, very often turbulence was encountered and people were using their sick bags. And some of you might be old enough to remember that unpleasant experience. <laughs> but with the turboprop aircraft and then later with the jet aircraft, most flights, everyone was perfectly fine. So quite a significant sort of health and safety difference with more modern aircraft. So here's the Viscount. This is another view. Nice colour shot, isn't it? Uh, there it is, the city of Auckland. Each of them were named after the main centres. It's coming into Christchurch at Harewood. Uh, it would be in the early 1960s. So they they uh, closed off the um, the outboard engines and just taxied in on the the inboard engines. And uh, a very advanced turboprop aircraft, very successful for British um, aviation for the late 1940s. Uh, one of these aircraft actually survives in New Zealand at Ferrymead. It's been out of the air for a, you know, an awful long time, but painted up in exactly those colours. And if you go to the Ferrymead Museum in Christchurch, you can see the Viscount on display. Uh, an aircraft that's now you know, 60, 70 years old, but still looks very handsome. Now here's another of the more modern aircraft. This is the Fokker Friendship. And these became very popular in New Zealand from the 1960s until 1990, servicing every provincial uh, air centre. This is at Napier, about 1965. And uh, there's the NAC bus. People forget that uh, in the early days, from the 1930s to the, uh, to the 1960s, you didn't often go out to the airport um, to board the aircraft or um, see people off. You went to the air centre in the town centre, like in the middle of Napier or here in Auckland, and you would go on the aircraft bus out to the airfield and then away you went. And that changed eventually because, of course, everyone had cars and more mobility. But so there's the NAC bus bringing the passengers out from downtown Napier for the service from, from Napier. Um, this is a book I wrote many, I've written about 12 books on New Zealand aviation. This is a book I wrote about lost aircraft in New Zealand. It relates a little bit to the accident I was talking about. And uh, this book is about uh, this particular aircraft that went missing on a Christchurch to Milford Sound flight in 1962 pilot and four passengers, including a honeymoon couple. The plane took off from Christchurch International Airport and disappeared in 1962, and nothing has ever been found. So I wrote a book about the mystery and uh, also gave some clues as to where I think it is in the lower South Island. But 
uh, I've got a section in the book on New Zealand's Bermuda Triangle, and that's from uh, Mount Aspiring Haas to Milford Sound, very uh, rugged tiger country. And there are at least five aircraft and 23 men, women and children missing in that area. And uh, the day will come when someone is well off the tramping track and they'll have to kick something, you know, in the undergrowth and there the plane will be. So that's, uh, that's a, a continuing story. And uh, 60 years next February, there's a gathering at uh, Christchurch Airport that I'm involved in to remember that, uh, that missing flight and the mystery of where it is. Back to the DC-3, uh, and this is the, they, they did a little bit of a revamp in the early 60s, and they call them the Skyliner, see on the tail? They put bigger windows, smart paint scheme, and they uh, redid the interiors. I'll show you that in the next shot. So this is ZKAYZ, and these were flown all over New Zealand. One of them still is based at Ardmore, and if you drive out there, you'll see it parked by the control tower and it's used by a private trust for uh, tourist charter flying. And sometimes you'll see it rumble over Howick here and around Auckland as it's taking passengers. It's been flying for over 30 years there from Ardmore. Now here's the interior of the same aircraft, ZKAYZ. Uh, this is March 1963. Isn't that a fine photo, isn't it? So there's the young hostess, and in those days they all were young. <laughs> they had to depart by about the age of 25, I think. Um, so this is her, she's wearing a summer uniform and a group of passengers there. So this is the revamped interior of the DC-3 for mica sort of effect on the wall. Nice 1960s curtains. So you're 1963, so that's almost 60 years ago. Um, however, despite the appeal of that photograph, it's really a very sad photograph too, because this is the interior of ZKAYZ that was involved in the fatal accident uh, into the Kaimai Ranges. A bit of a montage here. Um, so ZKAYZ. Uh, the top left photograph on a flight from Whanuapai to Tauranga on to Gisborne, Napier and Wellington. This is uh, the 3rd of July 1963. Went missing. Didn't arrive at Tauranga. And it took them three days and terrible weather to find uh, the DC-3 on the top of the Kaimai range. And it had basically plummeted, uh, I think, at about 300 feet from the summit more or less into a rock face and everyone was instantly killed, 23 people. This is the worst air accident in New Zealand. And uh, of course, Erebus is significant, but of course it wasn't in New Zealand. So Kaimai is still the worst uh, aviation accident in New Zealand and long may that be the case. So bottom left uh, in 2003, when I was a bit younger, I tramped up to the crash site with a number of others, and you can still see that the wreckage is all still there, and you can even see the AYZ and the undergrowth. And I realized at that time for the 40th anniversary that there was no memorial plaque for this worst of air accidents and some of the constructive learnings that came from it. So the photograph at right, there's me all dressed up. This is uh, July 9, 2003. And in front of me here, where we're looking at it, there was at least 500 people on the roadside. This is between Matamata and Te Arawa. It's the base of the Kaimais behind. And we just unveiled this large plaque with all the names. There'd been karakia and prayers and the local band had played. And uh, all the families of those 23 people were there at the service. And it was a very poignant and very special time. My wife Jane's a, an architect, and you can see there on the plaque, not only is there an image of the DC-3 at the top, but further down below is the seating plan for the, for the, for the flight. And uh, we, I, I stumbled on it on the records, and I showed it to Jane, and she said, why don't we make the plaque around the seating plan so that people can see you know, where the names of people were? And it was quite remarkable as the families came up just after that photograph was taken, they could see where their loved one, who was sitting next to them. 
and they met, you know, families uh, who'd gone through the same awful grief as they had. So you can see this plaque by the roadside uh, between Matamata and, and Tiara. It's well signposted, commemorating uh, New Zealand's worst air accident on New Zealand soil. Right, here we are back to Whanua Pai. Now, uh, the International Airport at Mangere was opened in 1965. Prior to that, for many years, they used Whanua Pai, which, you know, was the Air Force base then as it is now. So for a number of years, it was combined Air Force and Civil. So this is just before Mangere was opened. So we have here a SPANS uh, DC-3, they call them Viewmasters. Then we have an NAC DC-3 behind, a Viscount and two uh, Lockheed Electras, more modern Lockheed Electras. Both, both of those are flying to Australia, the distant two in the background, and the three in front of domestic um, services. So quite a grand sort of shot, isn't it? 19, about 1964, I think. This is at Christchurch, uh, at about 1964 too. So here's uh, SPAN, South Pacific Airlines of New Zealand. They were a competitor airline to, to NAC. And they modified the, the, the old DC-3 with the biggest windows any plane in New Zealand ever had. See below Zealand, you've got that very large window. It, it's over two metres long. So you had a fantastic view from the old DC-3 as it um, potted its way through New Zealand. And here's the Christchurch terminal. In those days, there was quite remarkable um, airport architecture that was very attractive and appealing. It's very different to today where they just look like big sheds. But uh, the new Christchurch terminal, you know, uh, replaced that one there some years ago. Here's, here's the view from one of the Spans uh, um, um, DC3s looking out that big window. Isn't that a great shot for a young boy with his, with his camera? So here's a friendship. This is actually taken at Queenstown in 1970. So uh, there's Her Majesty the Queen right in the middle in the oh, pink. Uh, so to the right, Prince Philip, and to the right again, Princess Anne. Princess Anne looks like she's wearing a hostess uniform, but she's not. <laughs> so you will see the two hostesses to the far left and the far right, uh, the, and they're, they're, the colours, this is, as they say, 1970, the uniform, the hostess uniform came out uh, called Golden Cloud in 1966. So it was already a few years old then. But um, the, the dress of the hostess is always appealing, the pilots, and of course, Prince Philip, uh, Prince Charles, just to um, the Queen's left. So they were flying on a tour of New Zealand. This is March 1970 and they were flying in two NAC DC-3. So very proud days for New Zealand's national airline to be, you know, transporting the royal family and the friendships were spick and span, I'm sure. Now, talk about the hostesses. This is, um, this is a new uniform, also introduced in 1970, so that... Um, that golden cloud uniform uh, was um, just out. So this was sort of, uh, they call this the, um, the lollipop uh, uh, uniform. And uh, now, do you know, where, where, where's that photograph taken? At the Auckland Museum. Oh yeah, the Maori, yeah. Now in our, our more politically correct times, I don't think you'd be allowed to hop onto the walker and actually do that, but anyway. Uh, there it is in 1970, and four of the NAC hostesses. Don't they look wonderful? You know, in, in 2007, I organised um, uh, a tour around New Zealand for uh, 60 years um, since the um, since NAC started, and we had a number of former hostesses with us, and remarkably, some could squeeze into their uniforms, and uh, there was two of them wearing these uniforms. One was the greeny one, one was the red. Well, wherever we went, they weren't interested in talking to me as the aviation historian. They wanted to talk to the hostesses. So wonderful appeal uh, in terms of the colour and the stories that the hostesses had to, you know, had to recount about flying in the 1960s and 1970s. <laughs> 
So here we are we're now into the uh, late 1970s. This is the interior of a Boeing 737. So 1968, the Boeing 737s were introduced on the main trunk from Auckland right down to Dunedin. So here we had, you know, large jet aircraft, very fast, very safe, very quick, flying very high. And that continues to, die, to today. So see the, the hostess in a uniform, she's handing out some orange juice. So that's in 1970. Yeah, so that photograph is over 40 years ago. Now the general speed of the aircraft at that time, the general comfort, is not much different to today. So while engines and technology and electronics have improved out of sight, the basic experience of you and me flying from Auckland to Christchurch hasn't changed a great deal in the last 40 years. That's what I would contend. So it just goes to show when the, DC, when the uh, 737s were introduced in 1968, this was very cutting edge technology and so efficient and so fast and so safe. And there's um, one of the NAC 737s and they flew in New Zealand for more than 30 years. And even the, the Airbus 320s, which now fly us you know, around New Zealand on the main trunk anyway, don't look you know, too dissimilar. So even at a glance, you wouldn't know that it, that photograph was taken uh, nearly 50 years ago. And I think probably my last, yeah, that's right here in New Zealand. So 1978, uh, NAC and our overseas airline, Air New Zealand, uh, were amalgamated by the Muldoon government into what is Air New Zealand today. And again, putting the pandemic to one side, Air New Zealand, one of the most successful and respected um, airlines uh, in New Zealand. Right. Well, I just wonder if there's any, if you might, I don't know what, Lee, what the practice is to unmute on any question time or have we run out of time? Not at all. If anybody has any questions, fire away. Okay. Um, yes, one question. Uh, when I said that I was, um, my first flight was when I was 13 in 1957, um, I was on the plane by myself and I swore to everybody that I could, the plane flew so low across the Cook Strait that I was scared that we were going to be touching the water and I could see the um, the things floating in the water and they always said, no, no, you're just dreaming. Would that be possible that I saw it was so low? So low. Well, I mean, it depends if they're coming into land, you know, they, they do go quite low over the water. So you can see the white caps, but it was probably an impression as a child of thinking we are very low or too low. So you could well have been, you know, on approach. Uh -huh. Aha, <laughs> It seemed yeah. to be the whole the whole yeah. trip. It's interesting, Claire, you you vividly remember that after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> no one beside me. I was just on my own. Well, that's my point about, you know, in terms of air sickness or turbulence, you know, if you're in small aircraft, you know, you get flung around. It's pretty scary for some people. <laughs> it's been a step here. I was interested to see the evolution of the overhead locker. You were talking about how the planes were flying lower and therefore they would have had more turbulence. But I did notice that none of none of the areas for stowing luggage up above had doors on it. So yeah, that's, they have a lot going on there in those flights. That's a good point, Deb. I, I think maybe, you know, we're more health and safety conscious now than we were. But you're right. I mean, um, things were flung around and this is one of one of the fascinating research topics I, I communicated with a lady who who in a small aircraft was literally I think her seatbelt broke and her head bashed up on the roof and she was injured and there was a big indentation on the ceiling and you know I, it's just unbelievable the sort of stories but yes I think they're highly conscious today about you know very careful about you know closing all those overhead um overhead containers aren't they mm. yes yeah very much we saw a, one of the photos you had and they had a, um we commented about the lockers and the lockers were on a um a slope like that so that you put things down into them yes and that was a good idea 
Mm. I, th I think the big difference is that uh, people didn't like their uh, little travel bags, which were about two feet long and about a foot thick. They didn't lug those on board in those days. You, no, you put a no, coat or an umbrella up the top. <laughs> Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? What people actually take on board. I guess that's why the airlines, even today, you know, weight is so critical, um, uh, you know, in terms of flying. And somebody mentioned in the early days, a small aircraft, it was quite common, you know, all passengers were weighed because the nature of how many passengers, if the plane could take only six, it might only take five well-built people. <laughs> so yeah. some interesting, interesting issues they had to decide at the counter, I think. Yeah, I th I think that when um, sorry, I think that when I, we were weighed, uh, my mother was I was only a child and my mother was quite big. We were separated and I was sitting in sort of the front right and she was somewhere around the back. So they were trimming the plane. Mm. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yes, very important. The smaller aircraft to distribute the weight correctly. Mm. That's an observation. You mentioned the uh, gypsy moth earlier on, early in the piece. From what I can recall, it was either the gypsy moth or the tiger moth engine was still being used as a training device in the 1960s in the Air Force. Yes, I think for the RNZ, if they might be right, um, Chris, I, um, I'm just, I can't quite immediately recall when they were retired as trainers, but certainly through World War II into the 50s, probably late 50s or early 60s, they, they probably, uh, you know, were sold. And interestingly enough, you know, there's a ton of tiger moths flying in New Zealand today. You can throw enough money at an old plane. At Clive, it's a bit like throwing money at an old car, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you can make anything fly again or anything drive again if you put enough money into it. Yeah. So there's a whole industry in New Zealand of restoring old aircraft, particularly the timber frame fabric aircraft. And uh, New Zealand's renowned for its tiger moths and many other vintage aircraft being restored. Ardmore is one of the, the centres here, not far from us here in Auckland. With the uh, mosquito is a classic example, isn't it? Absolutely. World-renowned restoration of, you know, war birds. There's a ton of interest internationally in World War II aircraft being uh, restored. And, of course, that's sort of mega bucks to do those planes but again you throw enough money at an old rotten fuselage and, and, and it'll fly <laughs> interesting seeing the lineup of aircraft at Fenuapai in the early 60s I was actually based there in 63 for a short time uh, just before um, Mungary was opened as an international airport Right, and then 63, Chris, that would have been the Kaimai um, crash time. About that time, yes. Because mm. the Air Force was flying Hastings and uh, Sunderland's two main aircraft around that time. I did a trip, uh, I went to Fiji in a Hastings and came back in the Sunderland. And there was a Sunderland flying down the uh, east coast of the North Island between North Cape and Auckland that told me as a 20 year old just exactly how beautiful New Zealand is. Yes. When you yes. see it from above there, there's no comparison. No, that's a very good point. And uh, if you go to, you know, the Motat hangar in Western Springs, you know, not the main Motat base, but out uh, near Ocean the zoo, Road. if you haven't been there, you know, once once we can move around a bit more easily, the, the, the aviation hangar there, you know, has a Sunderland on display and the Solent. It's a wonderful collection of, um, I call it an aviation cathedral, uh, an amazing place to go. I completely agree. Hmm. Um, Richard, uh, a few years back, uh, we went out to Ardmore and had a look at an Electra that uh, Rob Mackley was restoring. Yes. Uh, at that stage, he was almost finished. Has he now finished that plane? Is it flying? No, not flying yet, Clyde. This is a uh, a Lockheed Electra, you know, the early one that I showed you in the slides that pioneered the first service from Auckland. Rob Mackley purchased this one from, from Chile, of all places, and he's been working on it since 1998. So I, I think it's sort of 95% done, Clive, and it's a hugely important international restoration. I wrote a book on the Electra, so I know the type well. 
and uh, we're looking forward to the day when it can be, you know, literally launched for its first flight. It'll, it'll create massive international interest and TV interest here in New Zealand. So it's very close. And I know the, you know, I, I've seen photographs up until about six months ago and it looks almost complete, but there's, I think, more sort of final finishing work. And I suspect COVID-19 restrictions have probably held that up a bit. Yeah, yeah thank you. Hey, Richard. Hello, Richard. I want to Hi. know, say, compared, compared to, say, 50 years ago, what's the major improvement uh, of nowadays the airplanes? And what's the cost? I'm curious to know, what's the cost of an airplane? So, major improvements. Well, I, I think, like most things, the, the issues of, you know, fuel efficiency, speed, and um, you know, electronic development and all that have, have been you know, a major step forward, even if the planes themselves haven't changed much in the last 50 years. I can't really comment, uh, Wally, on the, on, the, um, on the cost of the aircraft, but I can tell you that air travel now is cheaper than it ever has been. And that's partly because of the efficiency of moving you know, big numbers around the world and even through New Zealand. So. Going back to the 50, 60 years ago, it was actually very expensive to fly from Auckland to Christchurch. You know, you sort of saved up for it. And most people actually took the train or car. Um, whereas now, you know, you get these cheap fares. We, we get a bit blasé about how cheap it is normally to fly to Australia or Christchurch. But that's, I think, a demonstration of the efficiency of the operation and that's you know a major advance in the last 50, 60 years. Oh, and where is our news, uh, Air New Zealand made in US or which country? Or we make it up by ourselves? You mean the aircraft themselves? Yeah. yeah. Yes, the aircraft are principally American or European aircraft. I mean, Airbus is European based and, and Boeing, you know, is is American. Um, I think there's developments in other parts of the world trying to break into the airline construction industry, including China, but I don't know how they're doing because it's a hugely expensive industry and the oh. wealth of knowledge that Boeing and Airbus bring, you'd be very hard to sort of break into that market. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you for being so attentive and um, I hope for the the women present, it's been a little interesting rather than just technological, but just bear in mind that sort of advance, you know, New Zealand being tailor-made for aviation, there was a cost along the way with accidents and learnings that now make flying in New Zealand incredibly safe, in fact, safer than you and I driving in Union Road, <laughs> truth be told, um, very safe, and that's a testimony to the learnings and some of the pilots and passengers who lost their lives that uh, were part of that learning. Well, Richard, thank you so much for your time. So I appreciate, um, appreciate it. And folk, if there's any questions that, any burning questions you have for Richard, please just forward them to me and I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him to answer them. But Richard, mm. thank you again. and. Um, Keep well, everybody, and we'll be in touch, no doubt. Good. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lee. Thank, Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant talk.